and we're officially with the ball rolling. Welcome everyone to this uh, fantastic session between Alaska and Colorado discussing CPACER, CPACE, Commercial Property Assessed Clean Energy and Resilience. We have a great panel lined up for all of you here today. Very excited to have these experts on the call answering questions and sharing their perspective. Um, so glad you all could join. This session is um, being recorded. So if you have to miss it, any part of it, you can rewatch it later on. We will make sure to distribute this. And we know that a lot of other folks were not able to make it live. So we'll make this widely accessible for folks. For the attendees, if you have any questions, we'll kick off with a quick presentation and overview of what CPACE is, introductions from each one of our panelists. We have a few questions that we will start teeing off for our panelists, and then we will open up the floor for your questions. And at that time, if you want to raise your Zoom virtual hand or type your questions in the chat, we will field questions that way. Um, and call on folks to unmute so that we can keep this a lively and interesting conversation for everyone involved. The reason why we decided to do this webinar session in the first place was after hearing Tracy Phillips of Colorado CPACE talk about their improved and relaunched uh, program and expanded eligibility um, I was just amazed by what they've been doing in Colorado and thought that there would be some great learnings and applications for folks in Alaska, um, but really for anyone across the country to be able to learn about the benefits of CPACE, what does and doesn't work, um, and share, share p different perspectives on the program. And so hopefully this is an informative session for all of you and that each of you get something out of it. I'm Melanie Lucas-Conwell. I run the Anchorage CPACER program. I've been working with the Alaska program for over three years now. Anchorage is the only program in the state. Um, and glad to have Tracy Phillips as my co-host for this meeting. Tracy. Yeah, hi everybody. Tracy Phillips. I'm the director of the Colorado CPACE program. I've, I've been with the program since it launched in 2016. And um, yeah, I was thrilled when Melanie reached out to me and we started collaborating on um, our two programs and thought this would be a really excellent uh, venue um, to have this kind of type of discussion. The four panelists we have are absolute rock stars in their own industries, but in, in definitely in the CPACE world. Um, if there ever was a CPACE super group being formed, these would be the four folks I would reach out to to get the band going. So um, I'm excited to hear what they all have to say, as I'm sure you all are. Thank you, Tracy. We'll have our panelists introduce themselves in a minute or less. We'll go with Jessica, Sean, Stu, and then Phil. Jessica, if you'll unmute to give your intro. Thank you, that tricky little mute button. Hi, I'm Jessica Lawrence. Um, I'm representing the energy consultant on this panel. Um, I'm an energy engineer and owner of uh, Boulder Energy Engineers here out of, based out of Colorado. But I'll be um, discussing, you know, how do we help support uh, project owners and all the other team to, to analyze um, savings and help you develop a great project. I'll go next. Um, my name is Sean Ribble. I'm the Senior Director uh, for Direct Capital um, and Originations on behalf of Nuveen Green Capital. We are a direct subsidiary of TIAA Nuveen. Um, I oversee originations uh, through a large swath of the uh, country. And um, fun fact, I was actually born in Anchorage, Alaska. So this is kind of near and dear to my heart, which is kind of a fun fact. Um, but yeah, well, we're the largest direct capital provider for CPACE. We've done over 700 projects nationally, um, cumulative about 1.7 billion of originations. So I'm really happy to be here and kind of share some information on the PACE program itself. Hi, my name is Stu Ogilvy, uh, owner of Ogilvy Properties, who we have done 
seven office buildings with the PACE program. And our, our model is a value add play for we generally buy older office buildings and then we fix them up and PACE has been a great way to finance some of our uh, energy saving um, upgrades. Actually, I did the first deal in Colorado I did with Sean and I think Sean and I did the first deal, first PACE deal in Colorado, I believe. I could be wrong, but I think we did that. Um, we did seven buildings. Like I said, we sold two of those buildings and we have five left uh, with PACE on them. So that's uh, that's me. I'm glad to be here and look forward to all your questions. Thank you. Bell? Yep. Yep. So, hey, uh, sorry for uh, doing this from the inside of my car. Uh, it's parent teacher conference uh, day at, uh, in Anchorage, Alaska. I'm a, a, a lender uh, that's been doing commercial lending for, gosh, like 28 years now and uh, extensive experience with commercial real estate and, and also uh, other forms of lending. Um, I'm the CPACER coordinator for, for North Rim Bank, which is a, 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 a state state bank up here in uh, in uh, Anchorage, Alaska, headquarters out of Anchorage, Alaska. Um, we have participated in a couple CPACE projects, uh, CPACER now uh, in Alaska, and um, and uh, definitely uh, um, one of the one of the cheerleaders for the CPACER program up here. Yes, you are. We've been very glad to have North Rim's collaboration and partnership. Uh, with the Alaska program. So thank you, Phil. Um, so that we're all level set because there are different levels of knowledge about CPACE slash CPACER in this uh, virtual room. And um, since we do have two different programs, we'll do a quick run through of what CPACE is so that we're all on the same page and then get into the questions for each one of our panelists. Um, and for those that are just joining, if you want to add questions in the chat um, after the introductions and Kickstarter questions, um, we'll get to audience questions at that time. And you also have the opportunity to ask them live by raising your Zoom hand. All right. So hopefully the screen is showing properly. Um, we're all here today to share learnings between the two programs. If this isn't the meeting that you expected, well, hopefully you get something out of it. So what is CPACE? Stands for Commercial Property Assessed Clean Energy. And it's a program that's focused on owners of commercial and industrial properties to obtain low cost, long-term financing, focused on energy efficiency, renewable energy, water conservation, and resilience projects that are funded by private lenders and paid back over time through a voluntary special assessment on the property. It funds both hard and soft costs of these projects. It improves the building stocks, decreases operating costs for the building owners. It is market-based and leverages private financing, as I mentioned. And overall, by having these improvements installed, spurs economic development and increases local job growth. Colorado and Alaska are in great company across the country. Um, we have 38 states that have enabling legislation and programs active and some in development still. There have been over $5.2 billion in investments made in CPACE projects around the country. Uh, which is in over 3,000 commercial projects and have created over 65,000 jobs and many more to come. Practically, what are we talking about that can be financed by CPACER? Now, there's a mix of, I mentioned energy efficiency, renewable energy, so we think of solar energy, but it also includes boilers and furnaces, HVAC, high efficiency, water heating, um, combined heat and power, cogeneration, building systems and controls, water conservation, as well as resilience improvements that include fire hardening, EV charging stations, stormwater management, seismic improvements. And for Alaska, we've also included 
in our state statutes, improvements of snow load management, which for those that were here last winter was particularly crucial um, and garnered a lot of headlines here in Anchorage, especially as well as erosion management. And the quick highlight for the Alaska Sea Pacer program, now Anchorage is the only program that's active in Alaska, but we do have the Matsu Borough that has enabling legislation and is working on uh, administration, uh, followed by potentially Kenai and Fairbanks are both talking about their enabling legislations and are in the works. One tenant for Alaska Sea Pacer is this is uh, privately owned buildings um, and you do have to be the legal record holder of the property. Commercial or industrial um, properties, which does include four and more multifamily units. It is for existing and new construction projects, as well as refinancing of projects that have been completed in the last 24 months. We cover both clean energy and resilience projects and uh, the maximum loan amount is 25% of the property's market value, which is defined as the assessed or appraised property value. And the loans can be for up to 30 years or the average useful life of the project. Tracy, over to you for Colorado. Yeah, and uh, you know, Colorado is very similar to Alaska. And for those of you that um, are looking to use CPAYS financing in other markets, um, most programs, the, the financing mechanism is, is usually very, very similar. Each program will have its own little nuances. So um, as some examples here, you know, types of property owners and everything else, same, same as Alaska, um, uh, commercial multifamily is five or more units in Colorado as opposed to four more units in Alaska. So those are the types of little nuances you wanna look for when you're looking at a specific program. Um, again, we, uh, in Colorado, we finance both existing and new construction. I'm, I'm, always, I'm always proud to say the folks that put together the program in Colorado, they actually introduced new construction financing to the CPACE world. So that's where it was first uh, launched. Um, and, uh, but there are plenty of programs that have new construction financing, but not all of them. So. Um, you want to uh, take a look at the program that you're dealing with. And in terms of improvement types and, and projects, yeah, very, very similar to Alaska. Um, in Colorado, we don't have that limit of a 25% uh, loan to value. It's dictated by the mortgage holder and or the CPACE lender. Um, we usually see 30, 35% as sort of a, a rule of thumb maximum, uh, but there's no real, uh, real rules there. And and uh, like Melanie mentioned a couple of times, we have a 25 year maximum finance term as opposed to um, Alaska's 30 year maximum. So um, yeah, let's uh, let's jump into it, Melanie. I like it, there we go. Bringing everyone back away from that. So hopefully that set the stage for questions um, and I already see some in the chat. Um, so we'll address those after we, we go through the questions for our panelists and, and answer those. So starting off with uh, Jessica, would love to hear more about uh, the um, kinds of services that you're providing to support the development of CPACE financed projects, if you'll give us an overview. Well, I could talk a long time on this, so I'm gonna try and be brief. And then uh, if anybody wants me to expand, just please ask questions or raise your hand. Um, our company offers a full suite of energy efficiency services, but I wanted to break down maybe the, the core, you know, three to five that are typically used in the CPACE. Um, if you don't know where to start, an energy audit is often what we used to say, it'll be kind of an over-encompassing, all-encompassing program. We look at all your major energy using equipment, kind of like a master plan of where do you want to um, prioritize your effort. So if for someone not knowing where to start or just getting into this, this is a good overall strategy. Um, you know, there's, if you're more very, if you're in a specific place, um, you often can just pick components of it. Say, um, for example, 
some who are just starting out might want a really detailed energy audit. Some of you who have already are very specific, we know we're just replacing our boilers or um, we're kind of at the end of it, may just say, oh, hey, I just need support of um, developing the energy savings calcs to uh, submit with the required documentation. So, you know, the, and all these services I'm listing, you know, the goal is to try and figure out what you need and then ask your engineer to help maybe tailor, tailor you know, the services and scope to fit with what you're needing. Um, you know, our job is really to help advise about, you know, efficient design and operation and then help calculate those energy savings, like I said, to um, to provide all the required uh, information and documentation needed for these projects. So energy audit's a big one. Um, a lot of people want, might want to use as they go through this process, some des um, design and project development work to help, you know, take general recommendations into actual design. So that's something we do a lot. And um, yeah, you want a new boiler, but what does that mean for your piping and sizing and capacities and things like that? So that can be a service offered. Um, energy modeling, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later. Energy modeling is more of a tool when we're doing new building construction, when we have to analyze the features against a, a baseline or a code, like um, a, uh, an energy code baseline to determine what our savings are. So um, energy modeling is something you're gonna hear a lot. Um, and then there's a couple of services on the backside that aren't a PACE requirement but are really important, especially for the owners and operators of the building, and that's commissioning. And that's when we say, as the, as the energy efficiency projects are getting implemented, you want somebody to make sure that stuff is working um, and installed correctly. It's, it's a service to kind of reduce the callback headaches and protect your investment to make sure you got what you paid for. And the measurement and verification is another scope or service offered is uh, to track, you know, actual energy savings, just again, to, to complete the feedback loop on, you know, might provide information for case studies or just to kind of protect your investment, what you paid for. That's a quick overview. <laughs> And we know there's a lot more where that all came from. Thank you, Jessica. <laughs> yeah. um, Sean, from a CPACE lender perspective, what do you look at? What should property owners consider to be part of the loan, not part of the loan? How should they be thinking about this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when looking at a project and kind of determining the application for PACE, Keep in mind that the program is earmarked toward things that are tied to improvements of energy efficiency or water efficiency. So as part of the budget for PACE and our capital, it has to go to things like your lighting, your windows, your HVAC, your roof, your insulation, et cetera. Obviously, Jessica and her team help kind of identify those measures as part of the application process. But at the end of the day, you're utilizing our program to be a part of what we refer to as the capital stack for either new construction projects, adaptive reuse or rehab. And then also even recapitalization. So projects that have been completed within a certain amount of time, we can reimburse you for those um, essentially and, and help you with filling that capital stack. What I will emphasize on this is our program is not equity, right? It is debt. So when you're looking at underwriting us in this part of a project and not to throw too many banky terms at you guys, but basically at the end of the day, you want to make sure that the project can stomach that debt obligation. Uh, we work with groups like Phil's where we are partnering with the bank as kind of a debt product that works in tandem with them. So really what you're making sure is that the pro property, when it is stabilized, can what we refer to as basically service the PACE debt, um, just like you would with any other debt obligation. And so when you're looking at a project, you wanna first and foremost, make sure that you have the measures that would qualify. Um, when you're looking at if it's more aesthetic in nature, right? Hey, I'm replacing countertops and carpet and you know cabinetry that is not gonna qualify for PACE because it is not improving building efficiency. But if you are going in for either a rehabilitation that does improve the building envelope and performance or for new construction, PACE can come in and really occupy a piece of the capital stack, especially in today's market, to make it to where you can actually get it financed because we can't do acquisition financing. You know, We don't do working capital, but with today, banks can come in and do the acquisition and then maybe we're financing the rehabilitation or we're working alongside the bank to be the stack 
for the ground up new construction to kind of get you the money in addition to your equity to do the project. Thank you, Sean. Um, and Phil, from the mortgage holder's perspective, from a banking perspective, and you've been part of two deals in Alaska and Anchorage, um, what advantages have you seen and why is Northrim willing to even consent and any tidbits for property owners as they have those conversations with their mortgage holders? Yeah, I think that uh, I think the big thing is uh, anyone who's um, lived up in Alaska for any significant uh, period of time understands that the uh, cost of energy, which is it might seem odd for an energy producing state, the cost of energy up here is uh, is fairly high compared to and and um, certainly not as high in Anchorage as it is in uh, the rural parts of the country or the rural parts of the state, but uh, but energy um, costs. Uh, it trans mainly due to some transportation issues and distribution issues uh, is is well above the national average. The um, uh, so for for Northrim Bank and how we view things, it's it's efficiencies mean a lot more in Anchorage, Alaska. Energy efficiencies mean a lot more for commercial real estate in Anchorage, Alaska than it does in Cleveland, Ohio, for example. I mean, it's just it's just uh, night and day as far as the cost of of uh, of you know, natural gas or heating and uh, electricity, especially electricity. Uh, these things are, um, you know, these things are, 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 are just, they can be deal killers as far as the cost of energy. So one of the benefits for us supporting the, the CPACER program is that uh, as buildings become more efficient, you know, then of course that allows, um, you know, it's, it creates efficiencies in our economy, it creates efficiencies in, in, uh, uh, in the particular building for sure. And then, of course, it creates a, its own separate industry as, as, you know, heating companies spend, you know, or, or, or generating revenues as they as they do these renovations and, and engineers and architects. And, and, and you know, there's already kind of a, a little industry being created just by the CPACER program. And so overall, it's a, it's a, it's a good catalyst for the state. And, and even if you ignore the efficiencies of, uh, of, uh, of the program. Let me, Melanie, I'm going to build on what Phil just said, um, specific to, you know, the mortgage holder consent request. Um, when a lot of folks talk about CPACE or hear about it, they hear that's one of the biggest challenges, right, is getting consent from the mortgage holder or the construction lender. Um, some tips I, I would give there. Number one, the CPACE now has been around a while. I think it, it started about 12 years ago in California. It's a, it's a much more mature market. So a lot of banks, a lot of construction lenders are now familiar with CPACE. They've had experience with it. In Colorado, we've had 43 different banks provide consent and 29 different construction lenders provide consent. So there, there, you know, there's quite, quite a lot of financial institutions that are aware of it. But one thing I would recommend whenever a project, a building owner, you're thinking about using CPACE, um, you want to discuss it with the bank or especially a new construction, the construction lender early on um, and, and make sure, you know, they're aware that you intend to use this. Are there any immediate red flags? You know, maybe if you're a new construction project and you haven't selected a construction lender yet, that's one of the questions you ask them. You know, you say, yeah, we're thinking to use CPACE. How do you feel about that? And then ask new construction lender number two and number three and see what their answers are. Because you don't want to be locked into a lender and then find out, no way, Jose, can you use CPAY? So um, so that's my yeah. advice on that front. I don't know if anybody else wants to add to that. Yeah, so I mean, I'll, I'll jump back in on that. I mean, I, I missed the Melanie's reference to the, to the lender's consent. Um, certainly, you know, that's it's a very important factor. One thing that, that, that Northrim Bank made a conscious decision um, early on um, in the CPACER um, program, CPACE program at that time, um, was to say that we are, uh, you know, in in general, we are uh, we are okay with with consenting to the assessments. Um, we don't just as a philosophical kind of, you know, East Coast West Coast kind of view. I'm not disparaging East Coast West Coast, but, but what I'm saying is that the 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 two schools are that this debt. And it is debt on with this with the with the with the pace program. Um, is it is it does it affect the loan to value? And um, and so the more conservative school of banking would say, 
well, yeah, you've thrown on a million dollars of of uh, of uh, of additional debt on here, and now instead of being an eighty percent loan to value deal, this is a ninety percent loan to value deal or ninety five percent loan to value deal, and we're we're not interested because the loan to value is off. Um, versus what our you know the school of thought that 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 we we um, advocate is that well it doesn't affect the loan to value because you have you have assessments, you know, utility assessments that, that have been in existence since, you know, since municipalities started. But then you also have, you know, property taxes that are subject to change and take priority over over liens. What we view it as is debt service. I mean, it's it's not necessarily uh, we don't view it as a, an impact on the loan to value of the property, but we, we do view the debt service associated with it. So um, if you're dealing with a lender that's that views it as is simply a debt service issue, not a, not an equity issue, then, you know, then those lenders are going to be more amenable to, to facilitating a C-PACE program, a C-PACE deal. And if you're dealing with a lender that's on the more conservative side, you know, it's important to know, not just if, if, you know, on the, on the new construction side, but especially on existing mortgages, that maybe this other institution isn't going to be okay with consenting to the CPACE deal. And so at that point, you're going to have to look at refinancing um, with some other institution that, uh, that um, is basically from the more progressive viewpoint. Thank you, Phil. Yeah, it's been a fascinating journey speaking to different mortgage holders and seeing their different perspectives. But thankfully, we have some that do consent and, and have been leading to the growth of these programs. Stu, over to you as a property owner. Will you give us an overview of the properties that you have had CPACE loans for in Colorado, what your experience has been, and um, well, perhaps might tee up why you couldn't have done any of this without CPACE, if that's not too leading of a question. <laughs> I'm sorry, I missed that. Was that a question to me? I'm sorry, my computer. Yes. Uh, Would you ask will you again? Tell us about, Thank you. Will you tell us about the properties that, that you've used CPACE loans for sure. um, since you have had quite a few in Colorado and yeah. why you've seen it as a advantageous part of your capital yeah. stack? Well, I, I have a perspective, you know, some perspective on all those answers that and all those uh, things that uh, was spoken about before uh, your question. Um, this pertains, what I'm going to talk about, it pertains only to, it doesn't pertain to new construction. It pertains to, for us, uh, buying older buildings. And then our job is to fix those buildings up, lease them up, and then sell them to a cash uh uh, investor who wants cash flow, so we try to solve all the all the problems in a building. So whoever's going to buy it doesn't have to solve those problems, and they're collecting uh, rent checks without all the problems. So that's that's we own office buildings. That's what we try to do. So my perspective on pace is to work. We're taking the savings in the energy that we save and the repairs and maintenance that we save by replacing these older mechanisms, lights, roofs, windows, and using that money to get new uh, equipment. And what we try to do is match up the savings against the loan payment, which is in a tax uh, that you increase each year by paying off this loan. So let me give you an example. If you have $10 in OPEX per square foot in an office building, and by doing all these things, you save a dollar in your OPEX. So now your OPEX is nine, but your taxes are raised by a dollar because now you got to pay the lender that finances those uh, 
mechanisms that help to save that energy, you're back at the same OPEX. So when a lender might say that your value is decreased, the answer is no, it's not decreased because your NOI does not increase if you use it in that manner. Excuse me, my lights keep going out. This is one of the ways to save money is to have motion lights like that. So anyway, so it for me, we've never had a tr trouble with a mortgage lender to convince them to do this because we explain you got to use it correctly. You got to use the savings to pay off the loan, which is in your tax payment. And the tenants are happy because they got newer equipment and they got uh, better um, HVAC, they got better lighting, they got better windows, they got everything better in a building that they actually occupied when it was old. So you got happier tenants, you got OPEX that it does not change because you have used the energy savings and repairs and maintenance savings to renovate your building with. Um, Plus, the other great thing about this is it's it's an assessment on your tax bill, which stays with the building. So when you sell the building, that tax bill is not paid off. It stays with the next owner. And the next owner, you got to make sure when the purchaser comes up and goes, what's this? You got to talk to them about, well, this is what we did. This is how it's paid off. And there's therefore no effect on your total value or NOI uh, going forward. And we've been successful in convincing um, uh, purchasers to ride with the program. As a backup, though, just as a safeguard, just in case we do have a purchaser that disagrees, we have a payout provision on that. Uh, pace uh, situation where we'll negotiate some kind of payoff with the with the pace lender. So we we have found it a very effective way of renovating a building and actually just using the savings to net out the cost of of improving our buildings. So that's what we've done, and we're very. Uh, uh, we're going to use it again, and we're very happy with the the use of it. Yeah, and let me. I'm gonna, Melanie. I'm gonna add to what Stu was saying too about the the um, selling of a building with a CPACE assessment on it, because it is it is uh, one of the qualities of CPACE financing that can be very attractive to a building owner. Right, it's part of the reason, really, why CPACE was created in the first place um, to have it be able to ride with the land, so to speak. But everybody always, I get this question a lot, they'll challenge, well, uh, how easy is it to sell a building with CPACE assessment on it? I think Stu just did a, a great job of explaining, you know, you just ha have to have a conversation. Um, and, and I remember when I had coffee with Stu, he, he mentioned you wanna have a broker involved that really understands the value proposition to help explain and do the storytelling to the buyer so that everybody is comfortable with it. The one thing I always say to people though, too, if you pay for these improvements out of pocket, right? Uh, e even if a building owner uh, wants to sell their building and the buyer says, nope, you got to pay it off, you know, uh, and they say, well, see, CPAs didn't work, right? You couldn't hand off the payment obligation. And sometimes that's going to happen. But what I tell them is, well, the other option, if you pay for it yourself or you take out a bank loan, you're paying for it no matter what. With CPAs, you at least have this opportunity to hand off the payment obligation to the next owner. So you wouldn't even have that opportunity with any other form of financing available. So it may not always work out. In Stu's case, it does work out because um, you know he knows how to discuss it with a building owner. And I think a lot of building owners are, are much more adept than I am about explaining what they did and, and their OPEX and all the rest of it. Um, so, so I've seen it as a model that works pretty consistently and Stu's definitely an example of that. Absolutely. And part of the reason why we wanted to have this session today. So thank you all very, very much. Um, we have one question in the chat regarding new construction, and I'll open this up to our panelists. 
um, asking about examples of how a new construction project could qualify and utilize CPACE. And of course, this might vary slightly from location to location, but if looks like uh, Sean, if you'd like to kick us off. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I definitely kind of bifurcate the use of the program into new construction versus um, a lot of rehab and adaptive reuse. So obviously so far the projects we've done, including with Phil and his team have been rehab in, in Anchorage, but you know, recently, especially this year, uh, we've been doing a lot of ground up new construction. Um, and the value proposition there, new construction is typically going to qualify for the PACE program purely because it is a new product, right? So the measures that you're putting in are going to exceed code purely by the nature of it being new construction. And so when we're looking at a capital stack, um, and when I refer to that, uh, I'll try not to make it too banky, but capital stack is the composition of how you accomplish financing and equity to build a building, right? So the, the various money sources that are coming in to basically comprise your construction cost to build something. And so in today's world, when we're looking at a project with PACE, let's just take the 25% loan to value. That correlates conservatively to 25 or 30% of cost if you just look at appraisal value versus your cost to build the building. When I look at your budget, if I earmark what we refer to as the low hanging fruit, which are your lighting, your windows, your HVAC, your roof, your insulation, your electrical, your plumbing, those measures are typically going to comprise 25 to 30% loan to cost, just purely on the basis of, of what their composition is of your, of your budget. That does vary based on asset type, whether you're doing hospitality or industrial, et cetera. But just for a general rule of thumb, let's, let's consider that, right? And so we are working alongside senior debt to gap fill the capital stack, because we can't be the only lender. But in today's world, a lot of times banks will say either, hey, this is over my legal lending limit, so I want to use PACE to gap fill because it's above how much I can lend on this, or I'm just trying to safeguard you know, construction capital. So if I can do 50% of the cost and then use PACE for 20, great. Um, and so what you're really doing in that scenario, because our cost of capital is so you know accretive these days, I mean, you're still in that 8% range, depending upon who you're working with on the capital provider. The value proposition is you're trying to reduce kind of your weighted average cost of your capital stack because we're cheaper than mezzanine debt. Um, we're not preferred equity. And so what you're really doing is trying to cobble together a capital stack between us and a senior bank lender or a debt fund lender to be your capital stack for the new construction. Like I said before, and Phil, you, you said it really well. In today's world, we're really not looking at loan to value combined anymore. It's a game of debt service coverage ratio. It says, hey, between the senior bank loan and the PACE loan, does this qualify um, on a stabilized basis and does it cash flow? And you would size the C PACE to what the senior lender is comfortable with. And that would be kind of your combined debt stack to build the building in addition to your equity contribution. So at the end of the day, the value proposition is combining two debt sources to get to your kind of leverage that the property can kind of stomach um, and using that for a ground up new construction. So that's the quick and dirty way of my explanation of why it, why it fits on the new construction or ground up side. And I, Jess, I would invite you, this is a, a, your opportunity to nerd out a little bit on how you support new construction projects, but I wouldn't get too deep. <laughs> yes, um, so because we don't have a built building, what are we looking at, right? So under the proposed design, um, we're going to be we're going to be creating an energy model for this, and that with the intent of showing how what percentage savings the proposed design has over a baseline code built, you know, code compliant building. Um, so we create what it's an energy model, and it's a ge geometric. Um, represented with uh, all the HVAC lighting schedules, inputs like that to um, cover what what's my building using. So this can be a great um, process for also informing the design practices. So as you're going through the design, you know what what's my design going to be? What kind of a efficiency do we want to consider? High efficiency or super high efficiency? And so this process will also really help inform. Um, you know, what it, what's the uh, cost and the associated energy value? Um, can we downsize, you know, if we do more efficient lighting, can we look at, you know, smaller chillers, smaller, um, smaller equipment? And it just is a good application to not only 
um, give you know Tracy and Melanie's team the information they need to um, say, yep, we we in Colorado it's be twenty percent or fifteen percent depending on what uh five sorry five percent for the the fifteen or twenty percent uh, loan value. But um, so it'll form that, but it also really can help you inform the design process. But always as a little asterisk on this is, you know, we, usually an energy model can take two to four weeks to create. So it's the better you get, you know, the sooner you get us in, um, the more we can help you. And, you know, if we engage in this process early. Did I miss anything, Tracy? No, that was that was great. And that, that your last point is a really important one that I want to reinforce is when, when a when a project comes to us, a new construction project in particular, usually the technical side is, is one of the last things people think about. They're usually thinking more on the finances of it. And as a former energy modeler, um, and I still have PTSD from those days, um, <laughs> when I make sure energy modeling comes up on their radar immediately and say, look, if you're going this route, you need to get an energy modeler engaged as soon as possible, because yeah, like Jess said, it's gonna take some time to get the model pulled together and um, get all that work done. And ideally, if a project comes to us earlier in design, that's really part of the intent of energy modeling is to influence the design, right? To maybe give them different ideas of different system types and orientations and whatever um, that they can model and then see how they perform. And then that can influence the design of the building. So if you can get, you know, somebody in during schematic design and energy modeler or, you know, that early, then energy modeling can really prove its, its value. Um, but regardless, the earlier, the better for engaging a modeler. Thank you. And same for resilience projects or, or other for that matter. Um, there, especially with both programs having expanded their eligible project types to include resilience just this year, there, there are a lot of nuances and different pieces that can now be financed by CPACE and CPACER. Um, so definitely does not hurt to get started early. Now, there are a few questions in the chat about um, financing and uh, perhaps Sean you might be the the best person to answer them um, one of them is about the average size of the loans that you've seen um, and then uh, the other question is on interest rates of course and uh, whether they're fixed or adjustable over the life yeah. of the loan yeah so um, obviously we were kind of the the larger group if you will in the pace world and so our our minimum dollar amount that we're lending off of this in these days is about two million. That's our minimum threshold. We have no caps in terms of maximum funding amount. Um, our average deal size this has gone up pretty substantially year over year because now we're doing a lot more as part of the capital stack just because of relative capital availability in the market today. Our average deal size is probably for our funding amount probably in that ten to fifteen million dollar range. And then the way that the rates work. Every capital provider does it differently. Our group prices on a spread over the 10 year treasury. Um, and then what we do is let's just say, for example, Phil is already involved as the bank. You guys have the project ready to go and you want basically a proposal from us. We issue term sheets. We will lock the spread over the treasury for 60 days. And then you actually rate lock two weeks before closing. Now, once you lock that rate and you execute the pace loan, the key component to it is that rate is fixed for that 25 or 30 year term. And that's the key benefit. To Phil's point, though, our group, we will negotiate prepayment penalties and structure around it. You, you, there is no lockout. You will have optionality, and that's part of the negotiation for a pace. So this is not like a traditional water or sewer assessment or benefit assessment where you are stuck with it in perpetuity. Uh, we negotiate basically that on the front end when we, when we execute a term sheet. And uh, yeah, adding to, to Sean, you know, um, Sean's point about the average project sizes and, and ranges. So, you know, Sean mentioned 2 million and up um, and the sky's the limit with Nuveen for sure. Um, they're, they, they tend to service larger projects. I know everybody in Alaska is probably saying to themselves, um, my building's worth $500,000. I'm not gonna need $2 million in CPACE financing. So um, who helps me, right? So. Um, there, there's a wide range of CPACE lenders out there that can serve all different size projects and all different types of buildings and different 
locations and all the rest of it. As, as an example, in Colorado, I think the smallest CPACE project that we've seen finance is $53,000. So, um, and, um, you know, $100,000, $150,000 projects happen all the time. So the, there is a, there are lenders out there willing to serve um, smaller projects. The one thing uh, you should keep in mind, because people always ask me, well, what's the lower limit, right? What's the, the, the smallest project? There's really no smallest project. But what I would say is this is long-term finance right? Typically 10 to, in Alaska, 10 to 30 years, you don't want to finance $40,000, you know, long-term. I mean, you wouldn't finance your car over a 10 or 15 year finance term. It just financially is not a great way to do it. So sort of the rule of thumb I tend to throw out is, is $50,000 or above, you're in, you're, you know, there, there's, CPACE can look good. If you're $250,000 or above, CPACE starts to look really good. So that's sort of what you should uh, keep in mind. Thank you, Tracy. And you absolutely read my mind as Sean mentioned, 2 million, like ah, some of our properties aren't even assessed that high. <laughs> we have much smaller buildings and we're still starting off. Um, and I'm curious, Stu, as you're dealing with your very efficient motion censored lights uh, throughout the Zoom. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's entertaining. I'm in the wrong room. I should have chosen another room. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, not a worry. No. Uh, curious from a property owner's perspective, what your experience has been getting these deals financed and, and working and talking to different lenders um, for any other property owners that are on the call or even contractors that are working with property owners. What has your experience been? Well, um, as far as uh, judging what uh, we have to do is um, I, uh, I do hire a company like Jessica's to give us an energy assessment and try to match the, um, as Sean said, low lying fruit like light lighting, which is a payback in two and a half years against maybe a new roof or solar energy, which will reduce your electricity to zero, you know, against new windows, which paybacks, you know, a roof at payback is 30 years or a, or a window. I'm talking about energy savings here. Uh, windows are, you know, the same. So the key is to match it up pretty well. Uh, payback um, items, that are short term versus longer term ones. And I talked to, I actually, I have a lot of building owners that call me about how to do this. And I say, well, you got to use it correctly. It's a great vehicle if used correctly. And if you are able to do it the way I think we've done it, uh, our mortgage holder um, is usually in agreement and understands what we're doing. That we're always checking our operating expenses. It, you know, you're you're in a market right against other buildings, so you know if your operating expense somehow increases by X amount, that's out of the market against other buildings that you're competing against. Then you're you're doing the wrong thing. So. What you want to always try to do is to net it out as close to zero as possible. Um, the thing with, and one thing I do tell um, bankers with the first mortgage is if, for instance, a building um, which is happening these days right now, office buildings are going back to lenders. And that lender, if there's a CPACE loan on it, now has to pay that CPACE loan because it's a tax assessment. But um, when they do move it forward and sell it, eventually that tax assessment stays with the new owner. So um, it, even if a tax is not paid, there are tax lien uh, buyers that do buy these tax liens and pay off the taxes. So it's actually a very safe um, vehicle for a mortgage holder. Um, they may have some liability for a short period of time if, if it does go back to them, but it doesn't last very long. It does get 
um, supported through the tax lien system, which uh, is basically government financing. Um, in, in a way, I always argue with people like Sean, who's giving me higher interest rates than I like, because I say this is public financing. This is not really uh, a risky venture for the, and I'm sure Sean's company understands this very well and is doing very well because of it. So I, you know, it's a it's a whole thing that you got to understand that uh, at the end of the day, the um, first mortgage holder is very safe in the situation, but you do want you do want an operator like us that knows how to use it. I think that's important that. It, it's very important to use it correctly. So I don't know if I answered your question, but I just went on what I felt like talking about. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> nope, absolutely. <laughs> Every point was helpful, at least from my perspective. <laughs> and there's my lights again, so there we go. Yeah. <laughs> it's your own self-timer <laughs> that way. <laughs> Perfect timing. Um, <laughs> So to close it off, since we're coming to the end, I would love to go through each panelist uh, and including Tracy uh, in sharing one takeaway, one piece of insight that folks here on the call today can, can remember. Um, and hopefully they'll make a nice collection of insights that will eventually grow the number of CPACE projects that each state is having. Um, and We'll go with, we'll start off with Phil and then Jessica, Sean, Stu, Tracy, and myself. So Phil, if you'll start us off. Just had to hit unmute. Um, yeah, it was kind of a, it was kind of a refreshing to see, uh, um, you know, the program in a lot. I mean, it's, it's it may sound weird from Alaska to say from a larger state, uh, like, uh, Colorado and what, where you guys have, uh, gotten the program to. So, um, uh, that part was kind of uh, uh, kind of we can see Melanie. I can see the future uh, someday once uh, once C pace is uh, up and running and across the state and um, and the volume has increased dramatically. Um, you know, as as this whole industry kind of uh, builds up here in Alaska, um, definitely uh, it was kind of a my uh, aha moment was just to see the, the that level of sophistication. So happy to participate because of that. Um, I think two, I have two points I wanna kind of share. One is I started out my, my piece of, um, the energy consultant is really here to help advise and help serve, so always, always talk and adapt to service and scope to, to accomplish whatever you're needing to do. I think that um, I've certainly seen multiple times when we can get in early um, and we can really be an asset to your team to help look at what options do you really have? How deep we, can we go? And really cover all the interactions that are happening in between equipment. And like I said, um, the example of what if we do a few energy efficiency features on the envelope or lighting? Can we really look at saving money on, you know, downsizing equipment? So again, make your energy consultant work for you and how do they help you and what's your goals? My second thing is that, you know, in all my years of buildings, um, you know, what typically happens is, you know, a lot of renovation or deeper renovation can go in phased approaches. Maybe we start with the controls. Next, we do the central plan equipment. And then we're maybe looking at the, you know, the zone level. This is a way to do it all at once. Because sometimes when you go in a phased approach, equipment isn't always talking to, you know, correctly together. When you have zone level equipment that's really old, um, you can't always do you know, all the right things that energy efficiency features on the central plant. So I've had time and time again, clients that were really able to do this in one fell swoop, do a deep retrofit and really have a high performance, you know, building energy savings and just the lack of comfort and, you know, maintenance calls and everything else associated with doing it often in a phased approach. So um, just, you know, like I've had many clients just say, God, we weren't even thinking about ripping out those old ugly heat, you know, electric heat panels in our zone because we just didn't have the money for it. We were able to do it and had a really visually aesthetic, pleasing space that was comfortable, no maintenance calls and lots of tons of energy savings. So um, this is a way to use it. 
Yeah, from a financial perspective, I think, um, especially going into 2024, um, the use of pace is only going to increase. And this is nationally just a really good tool to help round out the capital stack for good projects that need a little more funding in order to get to the place that you need it to be. Uh, what I would say from our direct capital perspective, um, we have very good working relationship with banks because we are not depository institution. So we are not chasing the true relationship the bank is. That deposit relationship, development relationship, and senior debt mortgage relationship still relies between the developer and the bank. We are purely here to help kind of with long-term fixed rate money to go to energy efficiency and water efficiency. And the last thing I'll note with regard to what we call risk mitigants with PACE, one of which is obviously what we had discussed, the transferability of the PACE assessment, how we can move us with the property without any approvals or documentation. The second piece, though, that we didn't really highlight is what we refer to as non-acceleration. And so Tracy had kind of touched on it, but basically, because we're secured by a tax assessment, we cannot prime the mortgage holder. So I, if there's a delinquent payment or a mispayment for the CPACE assessment, I cannot accelerate my obligation like you could with a mezzanine debt loan or a second deed of trust. And so that gives the bank a lot of comfort that, yeah, there's additional debt on this project, but they are still very much in the driver's seat even if there is a mispayment or something to that effect. And um, I would also just push that it's very helpful, and this is a shameless plug, but work with a group that is the servicer of their debt. So Nuveen, actually, we securitize the cash flows, et cetera, but we actually service the debt obligation as part of our asset management portfolio. So even five years from now with a loan and you're talking with us and Phil, it is still with us. Um, and you're having those conversations with us. If you're selling the property, you need to pay it off and things to that effect. So um, yeah, I think it's going to be a great tool and, and hopefully help with business development, especially in Anchorage. Um, I also want to make a point about uh, the use of this program is going to be very important um, because cities and states California's doing it, Denver's doing it, Colorado's going to do it. They've set energy goals for buildings. And when you have an older building, it could cost you millions of dollars to hit those energy goals. And PACE is going to be used quite a bit for that because um, you will already own a building and those goals must be met or you're going to pay fines. Uh, I'm not sure how um, these programs may get delayed or whatever, but eventually um, this is the way it's headed. So you've got to get your building energy efficient or your city may find you or your state may find you if you don't hit the goals that they set. So just keep that in mind as you work uh, through owning a building, which is a lot of fun sometimes. So there you go. Yeah, that, and uh, I'll just reinforce what I said in the beginning. The, the four uh, panelists you're looking at right now are absolute rock stars in their own parts of the CPACE universe. Um, and so, you know, if you need a building owner's perspective, you're a building owner, you want to talk peer to peer you need to reach out to Stu, or if you want to talk to uh, someone about the banking side of it, Phil's your guy, or a uh, C-Pace lender, like, like uh, Sean said, I think they've done 1.7 billion. By my math, that's one third of all C-Pace financing across the United States. So he'd be a pretty good resource to reach out to. And if you need a building whisperer, that's what I used to call Jessica, um, you, you, you need to reach out to Jess. And so, yeah, save their contact information and um and i would definitely recommend you reach out to any of them thank you tracy and thank you to everyone for taking well for those in alaska your lunch hour but for everyone else your afternoon to be here virtually with us we'll send some resources by email through eventbrite so keep an eye out for those as well as the recording once it has uploaded to the cloud and to youtube um, but thank you all very much, and please follow up with Tracy, with me, with any of the panelists with questions. We hope this has been engaging, and have a great rest of the day. We look forward to hearing from you. Thanks, everyone.